the first civil war takes place as the social war was coming to an end because Sala was made council in 88 BC and so then he was placed in command of the east against Mithridates. Now remember Marius wanted that command so he could gain, regain his popularity and, and get back into politics in Rome. Now, after the social war ended the following year in 87, the party lines, remember they kind of had stopped uh, and took care of the social war that was going on in Rome, but the party lines once again were drawn up and the same unscrupulous and violent methods were employed. In the People's Assembly, the tribunal's demagogue overruled Sulla's appointment of command versus Mirthodates, and they gave it to Marius. So here's Sulla marching to the east to confront Mirthodates, and they overrule his appointment and give it back to Marius. Now, Marius, he was the champion of the tribunal, the popular party, okay? He was for the popular's party, and uh, Sulla was the aristocratic uh, Optimus party. Now, a tribune had showed up at Sola's camp over in the east to advise him of the assembly's decisions, but Sola's troops did not transfer to Marius's side. This was a little strange because Sola found his troops were loyal to him rather than the state. So what did Sola do? He killed the tribune. He then abandoned all constitution protocol and he marched on Rome. He turns his legions around and he goes back to Rome and he did it with such speed he took Marius by surprise. When he returned he took control of the city. He murdered Marius's legislators in the assembly and it should be pointed out that only one officer of Sallus took part in these killings and the rest found it to be appalling. Anyhow, like I said, Marius was caught by surprise at the speed of which Sulla returned to Rome. And Sulla declared Marius an outlaw and Marius fled to Africa. Sulla then appointed his own people back in power and then he set out for the east again to fight Mithridates. Now, ironically, one could say that Sulla's method of using armed force was actually started by Marius's law of securing land for the army. And if the army in return had faith in its leader to win victories and therefore gain them land, which guaranteed the army material advantage, then the army would remain loyal to its leader. In essence, the relationship between the political and military power became increasingly clear. It was a circular type of relationship in which the political power was a reward of military achievement and military support was guaranteed by the use of the political power to now this is still chapter one we're talking about but and we're not finished with the Civil War but just to keep things in order we move into chapter two which is the first Mithridatic War actually started in 88 and ends in 84 now the king of Pontius Mithridates he was taken advantage of Rome's Jugurthine War, the Cimbri Migration, the Social Wars, and he started to campaign to take over the Asian territory. Now remember, here's a map. Now Rome controls all the Greece, Balkan area, Thrace area, but in Asia Minor, it's actually under the Kingdom of Paragama, which is a Roman ally and a Roman protectorate. So the Romans just have some local forces there and the local army there is really their police force. So when Mithridates invades that, he defeats the local legions and the allied armies there that were sent against him. Now, he was first welcomed by the people because he kicked out the businessmen who were exhorting them. But then he murdered the Roman citizens. Now, he, he murdered men, women, and children in the territory here to a tune of about 80,000 people. And then he decided to march in Greece. Now there's three major engagements that take place in the Mithridatic War. The first one is a Roman victory at the, we call it the Battle of Athens and Pyrrhus, which is the port there in the Attica area. This is in 86 BC. Now the Athenian government, they were a puppet of Mithridates, but in the north, 
the Macedonian governor was allied with Rome and he was holding off the Pontic army as what they were trying to march into Greece there until Sulla had arrived with five legions. Now Sulla went straight to Athens and he laid siege to it. Now the siege was becoming too expensive so he had to storm Athens and the port area of Pyrrhus. He ravaged the temple treasures to supplement his cost. Now Sulla allowed the sack of Athens but then he ordered a halt out of respect for the ancient city. Now this building here we're looking at is the Erkton and Sulla when he raided it his troops had burnt this to the ground so this building we're looking at was uh, actually that building that was burnt remember there's it's been built uh, twice because uh, the Persians destroyed it the first time they rebuilt it and this is what's left from the uh, Roman days and then you know this building here is the Parthenon and it was also sacked so just some cool pictures there and then Sala obviously does the right thing just like the when the Greeks had to fight against the Persians whoever was controlling the water here in the Greek Peninsula had a, a strategic advantage and therefore can determine uh, the fight and how to cut off your enemy here on the peninsula so every army including the Persians and and Sola does the same thing they move back into the Boeotia area and they that's the Plataea area you know uh, Thebes and they camp there because they don't want to get cut off because Mithridates he is controlling the sea right now now in this area it brings us to our second battle which also happens in 86 BC and this is the Battle of Chaeronea. Now again this is the famous statue right the lion of the Thebian sacred band uh, when they fought the uh, Macedonians and Alexander the Great. But this is the battlefield of Chaeronea. Now Mithridates he had broke through the Macedonians remember the Macedonians were holding them up why Sola was taking care of uh, Mithridates' allies now they had broke through and they had sent a Pontic commander his name was Archelaus into the Boeotia area and his army greatly outnumbered Sola's now at Chaeronea Sulla hit him with 30,000 highly trained Romans. Now as Sulla marched into the plain, he was obliged to turn his column left into line of battle to meet Achilles' approach. But Sulla's left wing was seriously outflanked, so he made sure to post reserve cohorts to the rear. Now remember in battles we're always hearing this. The Romans are established in their line. If they can't if they don't have enough troops to protect the flanks as the enemy they always put cohorts in the rear to protect their flanks in case the enemy gets around them and that's the same thing Solas does now Archelaus had 15,000 strong flanex with them now these were liberated slaves and they were covered by chariots with the cavalry and the light troops on the wing so it's a formidable force now his right had to outflank the Romans left but remember those reserve cohorts they moved up and they protected the line but these cohorts were eventually even beaten back now Sulla himself had to come from his right wing with the cavalry to the left and he flung Achilles's troops back there now the left was again reinforced. Sola sent reinforces there. So Sola had moved back to his right where Achilles was pressing the attack on that side now. Now the Romans finally prevailed and broke through the enemy line. The Pontic army fled in confusion. Now again, the Romans once again beat a Greek phalanx or some version of it. I'm not saying they were the best but once again the Roman legionaries come out on top. So the Romans are 2-0 and oh so far against Mithridates. Mithridates hasn't fought yet but Sola is 2-0 and oh here. Now this moves us to the following year and this was the Battle of Orchidomenus because Sola had followed Archelaus to the city and Sulla started digging entrenchments, but Archelaus launched a cavalry attack which drove the Romans back. And Sulla personally saved the situation by rallying the legionnaires and forcing the Pontics 
back into the city. And then, you know, basically every new assault on the Roman entrenchments it only exposed the Pontic to counterattacks. And Archelaus' archers found themselves all too often using their arrows as swords. Now the next day the legionnaires were still digging entrenchments when Sulla noticed the whole Pontic army ready to assault them. And in a vicious counterattack, the whole Roman army attacked and routed the enemy. Mertodates at this point disowned Archelaus and kicked him out and exiled him. And so he went to the Roman side. Now, why this stuff's happening, okay? These three battles, battles take place. It's 85 BC. Now at this point, Sulla is finally supported by Lucinius Lucilius and his fleet, which took Sulla's army into Asia. But here, he found a hostile Roman army under Gaius Flavius Fimbria, who was ambitious in his own right, because he had murdered the commander of that army and was commanding it himself. Now, how did this happen? Well, because Marius had returned to Italy from Africa, he gathered forces loyal to him, he took over Rome, and then he ruthlessly butchered his opponents and put his people back in charge. You know, you can't make this stuff up, man. But what happened to Marius? He dies. Now his people are in charge, but he's dead. Now his party, the popular party, what they decided to do was send an army to Asia to show Sulla's legions that this was the true army of Rome and not Sulla's. So when Sulla had entered Asia and found out that there was the legion under Fimbria there, uh, Mithridates became less of a threat to him. And it just so happened that Mithridates was having internal problems at home as well so the both commanders came together and they agreed to a peace and this ends the first Mithridates war it's like 84 BC right and Mithridates got to keep all his original territory but he gave up the territory that he took in Asia basically the Paragama territory now Solon he then turns around to Fimbria's legions and he paid tribute to Fimbria's army to join him which they did and so Fimbria realizing that he was done he has no army he just killed the Roman commander because he was gonna you know march on Rome himself he commits suicide now I also want to mention here that Lucullus he must be given an honorable mention because he managed with just a small fleet of 10 ships remember Rome's divided at this time and he only has so much support but he managed with 10 ships to enlarge it because he started attacking Greek islands that were loyal to Mithridates and he started capturing ships so he was uh, enlarging his navy and he did this without extorting and bribing neutral parties I think that's an honorable mention and at the same time he was eluding the Sicilian pirates that were also working with Mithridates so very talented commander Lucullus now, he sailed to Cyrene, Egypt, Rhodes, and then managed with the help of the Rhodesians in defeating Mithridates' fleet. So this is what allowed Lucilius to support Sulla's forces that crossed into Asia. So all that is happening. Now, you understand Gaius Marius had died. He is 3-0 and in major engagements in his life. Remember, he beat the uh, Teutones and the Cimbri and uh, won a major battle in Africa so that that's his legacy he's the third founder of Rome and we just got through going over his story what's happening now with Sulla Sulla left Fimbria's legions in the east and he took his legions and returned back to Rome because now he had to straighten out Rome the legionaries were disgruntled about not getting Mithridates but Sulla the ever clever diplomat he pacifies his legion so Cornelius Sulla is really a great leader now when he lands in Italy there was an army waiting to fight him but the officers went to Sulla's side including Nias now we you can pronounce this Nias or Nias I pronounce it Nias Nias Pompeius was one of those officers that went to his side now this is the future Pompey the uh, great Anyways, the Samnite Italians disliked Sulla, for he fought against them in the social wars. Remember, Sulla fought in the south there, and so he had to deal with them. 
Now remember our social war ended in 87 and we had the first Mithridatic War. Well in 83 we the second Mithridatic War starts as well as the civil war between Sulla and Marius uh, supporters was still happening. So in the second Mithridatic War there was one major engage engagement. It lasts from 83 to 81 BC this war. The one engagement was at Halley's River. Now one of Sulla's legati in Marina, he was left in charge of the Asian forces to restore it but found some cities were rebelling and that there were still Pontic forces in the Cappadocia area. And so he marched into Cappadocia and this is really what starts the second Mithridatic War. And after many messages back and forth between Mithridates and Myrina, Mithridates finally believed in the Romans wanting the war, he attacked and he took all the Roman villages and met Marina along the river here and he defeated him and chased him back into Phrygia. News of this victory caused many to change sides to the King Mithridates. Now the king of Armenia, Tigranius, he also started taking towns in Cappadocia area. So now there is a pretty big uprising going on in the east again. Now Sulla believed the war was wrong against Mithridates and he struck out right away to make peace and these conditions were favorable to Mithridates and this ends the second Mithridatic war and King Mithridates uh, enlarged his kingdom. Sulla had to still deal with the civil war that was going on so in 83 why that battle of the Halys River was in the east and this is a Roman that was a Roman loss Sulla is fighting the battle of Mount Tefata in 83 in Italy now the popular party commander remember it used to be Marius is now the consul Camius Norbanus and his army of supporters were routed by Sulla's legions and Sulla wintered at Capua now on his way to Rome then the next spring he cut to pieces an army under Gaius the Younger and then entered Rome but found there was a large army massed against him there. Now Sulla gains two more victories here. So it's another Roman victory and another Sulla victory. But as he reaches Rome he finds that there's an army there waiting for him. And this is the Battle of Colline Gate in 82 BC. The popular party led by an army under Pontius. That's not the same, you know, Mithridatic King Pontius guy. This is Pontius. And they attacked at the inner wall of Rome. Sulla's legions fought an all night battle, finally gaining the upper hand and routed the attackers. Meanwhile, Sulla's lieutenant, Quintus Cassilius Metillus, defeated a second rebel army at Fenza. The victory of Sulla's aristocratic party was now complete and Sulla was now made dictator and what he did was he start changing the, the laws because he didn't like people like Marius who came out of nowhere and didn't belong to any wealthy class or nothing and just made his way by ambition up through the ranks to become one of the problems here at Rome. So he started out, the first thing he does is he deprives the Equites the rights and the honors that were granted to them by the Gracchi brothers. And he reduced the power of the popular assembly, remember that's the tribunal, the plebeian class, to a position which it occupied in the years before the struggle of orders. Remember the struggle of orders were like 450 BC when they gained a lot of power. Well he set them back years centuries and then he was because like I said he's trying to stop someone like Marius from coming to power you have to come to power by strict order of assent and so he made rules that one could become consul only after first serving as a quaestor or a praetor with time limits between each now the new trouble that would come in the future would not be from the consuls and praetors though the new trouble were going to be coming from pro councils and pro praetors. Now let me just explain here for a couple minutes. Remember the highest office in the land was the consulship, which if you wanted a military career or a political career in Rome, you always sought the consulship. But remember, you can only be a consul for one year. So if you still wanted to continue 
and show your military skill, the next best place to go to was to be a pro council, which is basically basically a governor of a territory. And then you would you or you can be a pro praetor, which was basically under the pro council in these territories. So most councils when they were done with their councilship, they would go be pro councils because now you were still in charge of a territory and there was always at least one legion stationed under you so you were still in command of a legion and in times of trouble you can be sent more legions and therefore you would still have command of an army be able to show your military skill and your administrative skills so that was the next best thing uh, uh, office to be held after you were done with consulship so in effect when Sala was reducing the power of the tribunal the assembly and keeping plebeians from having too much power in a consulship well the next best thing was to be a pro council so now from a pro council position you would be able to obtain your power now think of this when you have elections coming up you spent time campaigning jostling for political favors because you wanted to be elected council but overseas wars they're not going to stop just because you have this election coming up the overseas wars still had to be handled so the senate would put the power of these overseas wars in the hands of the pro councils so now your trouble is going to come from the pro councils or pro praetors and basically Sulla's constitution uh gave us new problems you know it could be manipulated as as any form of rules and laws you know always are two magistrates could not administer authority over rome's wide increasing areas even with the help of the praetors so magistrates had welded great use of the pro magistrates pro magistrates did not have a term limit therefore either so ambitious and military capable individuals could wield great authority now pro consuls which we know were the governors were placed in position by the consuls to be used as their own puppets a private person could hold command in an overseas province these overseas territories did not meet the same constitutional obstacles as the ones that were in Italy pro consuls and private power was limited to certain areas but magistrates could use legates you know these are the legion commanders to wield power in wide areas such as pompey did against the pirate menace now pompey's campaign for example against the pirates had his tenure extended for three years and made use of his 24 legates so when Pompey held proconsulship in Spain in 55 and then consul in 52, he governed the province of Spain even though he was a consul through his proxy and his legate. So you see, Sulla's constitution had been completely eroded. Now Lucius Cornelius Sulla was 6-0 and in major battles. And you know, that's pretty good if, you know, following our Roman commander's records. We're going to end this video here, and we will continue in the next video, Pompeius the Great. Uh, as far as Rome's battle record goes, uh, Sulla improved Rome's battle record by six victories. Remember, three in the Mithridatic Wars and three in the Civil Wars. Uh, I give Lucullus a win for his naval game engagement against Mithridates. It was quite an achievement. So there's another Roman win. So the battle record improves by seven victories. But uh, Mithridates did defeat Sola's lieutenant, Marana, uh, in the second Mithridatic War. So there's that loss there at Hades River. So we improve Rome's battle record goes to 55 and 24.